The um, camera is here because I'm just trying an experiment in creating the videos of the class to perhaps include stuff on the board and so on. So I'm going to just see how that goes. But uh, otherwise, just ignore the camera otherwise. So we left off talking about ZFS, right? Which is a, it's a much different kind of a file system. And we talked about the fact that in ZFS, blocks are immutable, right? So when you write a block, it writes a new copy of the block. And that makes it very easy to create groups of transactions. And then it's very easy to determine what a commit is, right? The commit is writing this root of the snapshot successfully with its own internal checksum. Um, when you do a write, right, we've got the POSIX layer in ZFS. So we know the POSIX layer is things like open, close, read, write, seek, and so on. Okay, so that gets turned into things like make these changes to these objects. So for instance, make uh, this change to this inode, make this change to this uh, uh, data block in a file, make this change to this directory entry in a directory. Okay. Um, and of course, from the lower level point of view, it doesn't know what are directories, what are regular data blocks, and so on. It just has this idea of objects that can be written into. So the data management unit is that lower level, and then it'll then take these transactions, bundle them into groups, and flush those. So the idea is we have a trend, so a POSIX call, like read or write, is going to turn into a transaction. Multiple transactions are going to accumulate into a transaction group, similar to what happens in uh, ext3 or even in um, xv6 and then a group of those go ahead and get committed and the way they get committed again is by bubbling up until we've got a new root snapshot does that make sense and so we do this based on either how much memory we have because all this stuff is being cached in memory or based on time and if we never get if if this transaction group never gets committed, of course we lose it. Again, just like in ext3. Um, and then this transaction group basically is handled by the storage pool allocator, which will actually write the stuff out to disk. There's a lot of caching, a lot of prefetching, um, and there are things like if you're trying to do a read of a block that's not in the cache you might also have at the same time, right, so let's say we've got, we, we look down here at the storage pool allocator. We might have issued a write of a transaction group, you know, down into the storage pool allocator. So it might be busy doing a lot of writes. And yet, we have a read that comes in. Well, if the read comes in, we actually want that to take priority over the write, because we can't do anything, at least, we can't do anything until we get that back. And so therefore, the read will kind of come in as a, uh, you know, skip to the front of the line. Okay. And the hope is most of your reads are going to be handled from the cache, right? That most of the reading and writing you do is, is done in the cache. But, of course, sometimes you're going to get cache misses and you're going to need to go, go to disk. Um, and then also the cache is interesting. It tracks not just least, least recently used, but also adds a flavor of kind of most recently most used. Okay? So if you've got something that's used a lot, but hasn't been used very recently, it's still going to have high, prior, high priority. Okay, if that makes sense. Under the theory that it'll, it'll come up again. Uh, the copy on write. So the 
copy and write allows us, instead of just writing all over the disk, we can write in sequential areas, and that can be very fast. Okay, so by grouping together a bunch of what might otherwise be random writes into a sequence of sequential writes that really increases speed. Dynamic striping, let me show you this. So, let's say you've got your storage pool allocator, okay? And we've got on it, I'm gonna not show mirror disks, so I'm gonna just have unsafe, these are not very pretty disks, sorry. But those are my disks, which get worse and worse over time from left to right. And I write some data. It's going to stripe this across these multiple devices. So let's say this is the first sort of block of data, the second, and the third. One, two, and three. Advantages of striping again? Faster. Faster to do what? A lot of things. <laughs> like? Uh, if you're writing, if you're writing. Okay, uh, I'm writing, I can be faster because they can be working simultaneously. And if I'm reading, the same idea. So yeah, writing and reading, which is the big thing you do with disks. <laughs> Your data is spread out over more of them as opposed to just constantly using just one of them? That's so, like, another point. So we are... Um, if we put the first third of data all in the first one and the second third and the third third, um, then if we have a disk that, if we have sort of this volume that's not utilized very much, this one would get hammered a lot and these are those we wouldn't use. So, it, so it, it spreads out our usage. What's the downside? If one just dies, all your data is hosed? Yes, so your reliability now, right, if, if your reliability on a single drive is five nines, what happens when you have three of them? It's less. It's less, yeah. And we would have to figure out how much less, right? It's, uh, well, it's actually not that hard, right? It's 0 0.9999 to the third, right? So we go from to, and what we certainly know is that exponent, as that goes up, that, that goes down quite a bit. So we're reducing our reliability. We have four nines and a seven. We have four what? Four nines and a seven. Four nines and a seven? All right. And if we went to five drives? Four nines and a five. All right. OK, so just give us an idea there. OK. so. Uh, how can we avoid this loss in reliability? One way you can do it is with mirroring. So we can just say each of these drives is going to have a mirrored drive. Okay? Let's say we go ahead and make a mirror. I'm going to come back to the dynamic striping in a moment. So I'm going to add a mirror to this drive. So this is our mirror. And so our block is going to be here too, right? Now, when we do a write, when can we successfully say the write is done? Yeah? When it's on both drives? Yeah, I guess to be safe, it's when it's on both drives. But for a read, we just need to read from one, right? We'll read from whichever one is less in use, right? So, I mean, we could randomly pick one, or maybe we're smarter and we know we're in the midst of using this one, and so we go ahead and read from it. So let's say we read from it, okay? We read our block. The whole reason of having our mirroring is in case we have errors with one of them. So how do we know that we have an error? Check some. Yes. What check? Which is stored where? Is it stored in the red 
block there? No, it's stored somewhere else outside of this. And so we know what the checksum should be. So the storage pool allocator, when you're, it's asked right, uh, for a virtual address, you give it the disk virtual address and you give it the checksum. And it goes through and it says, okay, let's flip a coin and it comes up black or heads or whatever, right? And it says, okay, I'm gonna read from here. It reads the block. It checks the checksum. If it passes, it returns the block up. If it doesn't pass, it knows that block is bad, right? So what does it do? Go to the blue one, go to the mirror, read it. It crosses its fingers, hoping this checksum will, will work, right? If we had a bug in a driver, let's say, maybe it was just writing the same bad block to both of them. Right? But assuming this works, it's going to pass up the blue result up instead of the black result. And then what's it going to do? Fix the black. The black's bad. Make it good. Right? We know the good one. Make it good. Does that make sense? All right. Now let's say we add a fourth disk. We paid good money for it, so it looks much nicer. <laughs> and we do another write of another file. So here our striping is going to be 1, 2, 3, and 4. So okay, this, this idea of dynamic striping is whatever, however many I think they're called VDEVs, virtual devices you have. So a, a combination of something that's mirrored is a virtual device. However many of those that you have, it will stripe across, across those. Okay? So we can start taking advantage of the capacity on this, on this new drive. Uh, if you need to take a drive out of commission, like this one, it can copy over the allocated data over in here. Now, if we look at non-ZFS, if we've got a mirrored drive, let's say, do we have any way of knowing? So let's say we have two blocks that are different at a particular location. So we're doing, a, we're doing some sort of an analysis on the drive to see uh, what's bad and what's good. We don't have any way of telling which one of these is correct. Okay, so we're, it, it's kind of difficult. The fact that we have this external checksum allows us to know which one of these is correct. Um, you can migrate data off of these in preparation for pull, putting a new replacement drive in, for example. Resilvering. So resilvering. Do I have? There we go. So I had to look up what this meant, right? This is, if you have an antique mirror, or if, if, you, if you imagine mirror, it's a piece of metal or something that's shiny with glass on top of it. That shiny thing used to be silver, right? actual silver. And what could happen is it could get tarnished and then it kind of looks, looks cool and antique-y, but you can't see yourself very well. Right? So the fix to that is take off the glass and re-silver it. Okay? Well, that's the idea of basically taking out a hard drive that's not so great and putting in a nice shiny hard drive. That's resilvering. Okay? In traditional RAID systems, where the RAID driver doesn't really know what's in it, all it knows is there's a bunch of blocks, it has to copy over every single block from the old drive to the new drive. ZFS doesn't need to do that because ZFS knows exactly which blocks are in use and which blocks aren't in use because it's the storage pool allocator that does that. So it just copies over the blocks that are uh, being used. Okay. All right, let's, any questions about ZFS? Uh, one other nice thing about ZFS is just it's fairly simple to administer, uh, which is kind of nice. All right, let's come back in here.
All right. So this VM primitives for user programs. And one thing to keep in mind here is that this was written back in 1991. So kind of a while ago. So far what we've talked about, especially with XV6. So let's ignore JOS for a moment because JOS actually provides virtual memory primitives to user programs. And JOS was written after 1991, okay? So, but XV6 was based on Unix v6, which was written when? Give me a decade. 80s is too late. 70s, yeah, kind of the early, early to mid 70s. And XV6 didn't use virtual memory. Okay, it wasn't until some folks at Berkeley added, added virtual memory. So we're gonna dis we have previously discussed virtual memory usages of virtual memory in order to optimize the kernel, right, and to provide protection and so on. We are also gonna look at the MMAP homework assignment. And then what we're gonna talk about is basically how VM can be used for user programs, which we've seen in some examples of with JOS. Okay. Uh, and so concurrent garbage collection, concurrent uh, generational garbage collection. Um, the paper actually talked about concurrent checkpointing. Right? Checkpointing is this idea of saving your memory state of your program so that you can come back to it later. So virtual memory provides a mechanism that can be useful for that. A persistent store. The idea here is rather than reading and writing to files, just deal with objects in memory and allow them to persist even across program invocations. Okay. I think I mentioned uh, the Palm Pilot that sort of had this idea, except they didn't actually have, the persistent store was memory controlled by a battery and a capacitor so you could replace a battery quickly. Data compression paging is something uh, that not as important these days because memory is cheaper. But the idea is that you're, you, instead of paging from memory to disk, page from memory to memory by compressing. So I can take... you know, this amount of memory and compress it to that amount of memory. And I can do that quickly, save it in memory, and so I've got stuff that's not usable in one chunk of memory and stuff that's inusable in another chunk of memory, and I page it in and out by compressing and decompressing. Okay, that assumes it's compressible, for example. A lot faster than using a spinning magnetic disk, right? Lots, lots, lots faster. So the primitives that the paper discusses. We need a way to handle a page fault in user mode. We've seen we've seen one way of doing that, right? In JOS, we wrote a way so that you can set a, what's it called, sys? set page fault up call handler, or just page fault up call, yeah. So this is basically equivalent to sys set page fault up call, okay? Protection one, so decrease the accessibility of a page. That is, make a page so that it is uh, no longer just generally read-write executable by, by your user program. Protect N decreases for a bunch of them. The reason that we separate those is that in some cases, right, the cost of a single protection call may be a lot, and by doing a protect N, we may be able to amortize that cost against setting multiple pages. And so if we can write a algorithm that is using a small set of calls to, pr to protect N that may be a lot quicker than an algorithm that writes this, deals with the same number of pages as 
a number of calls to protect one. Unprotect increases the accessibility of the question. But why do we need protect one? Why can't you just call protect n with n equal to one? Well, you certainly, you can. Um, So if you have a system where protect n is n times as much time as protect 1, then you might as well just provide protect 1. Right? That's another way you can look at it. Once you have protect, if you have a fast protect 1, all you need is protect 1, and you can call it in a loop. Um, dirty returns a list of dirty pages. So this is stuff that's, that's in, not normally accessible to a, to a user level program. right? Which of my pages have I visited? In this case, since the last time I called dirty. How do we do this in JOS? How could we find out? Yeah. The user virtual page table. The, yeah, the user virtual page table is readable by us. And so we can look and see the dirty bit. Although it's a little bit of an issue because if we want to know what dirty from this time to this time, how do we under how do we clear the dirty bit? Right? And I don't know. I don't know how we clear the dirty bit. It's whether we have such a mechanism. Yeah. That's what I was gonna think. If if we do this page map. There's like a couple places in the code where it says use this page map to clear the dirty bit. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this page map, since we turn off all the bits outside of the syscall range, that includes the dirty bit. So we do have a mechanism for turning, turning that off. Uh, and then map to same physical page mapped at more than one virtual address with different uh, levels of protection. So sysset page fold up called as a trap. Protect one, again in JOS, is equivalent to sys, uh, yeah, sys page map, right? And protect n, yeah, <laughs> n sys page maps. Uh, increasing accessibility of page? Sys page map, yes, this is our friend. Dirty is Look at the U, V, P, T, and call this page map to clear. And map to this page map. Yes, this is our workhorse. This page map. Okay. Plus, this page map can actually map the same physical page, not just within a single process, right, but across multiple address spaces. So we can do even more than this. All right. In Unix, in traditional Unix, in the first versions of Unix that had virtual memory, we have only these higher level abstractions. And the problem sometimes with providing higher level abstractions is they come at a cost, right? You've got users of those abstractions that don't care about some parts of those higher level abstractions and are paying a penalty. We have non-overlapping virtual memory error areas, right? So we've got uh, area one and area two and area three and each one of these shares permissions, right? and backed by the same object. So we can have just regular memory, or we can have it backed by a file. Uh, uh, so this could be file on disk, and this can be just anonymous. So this is nothing new. MMAP allows us to map memory into our address space. So we can, I'm going to skip the mapping of file for a second. 
we can say we want to map this amount of memory and we want to read or write. It's private, no one else can see it, and it's anonymous. It's not a file, so it's, since it's not a file, we don't care about these. Where's the address that we're mapping to? Yeah, wherever the um, OS decides is a good place for it. Okay, so it'll be in your address space because it's going to give you back that address. Not always what you want, so that's what the null is, right? The null allows you to provide an address and say either it must be here or I would like it here or near here. Okay. We'll come back to this as we look at the IMAP homework. And then mapping a file, the difference is it's not anonymous, and we actually have to press a file descriptor. And the offset allows, a, allows us, I believe, to map to a subset of the file. Okay, so we don't have to start at the beginning of the file. Questions on the mapping? How do we implement the mapping to a file? So let's say we get a, let's say we map a file, okay? So we'll just reuse this diagram. So this is memory, and this is our file, and there's an in map that's set up between these two. Okay, and we've got ABC123, hello world. And these are written really large in the file, so those are all a page each. Okay. Or they're repeated a lot or something, let's say. Okay. So when I do the map, do I read this into memory? And the answer is, why do it now? Because you might not need to. Right? Are you guys familiar with the software engineering term Yagni? You ain't going to need it, right? Don't do. So, yeah, you ain't going to, I have to say it that way, need it. Or at least you don't know you're going to need it. So, don't do work in programming that you think you might need for the future. Just do what you need to do now and let the future take care of itself, right? And refactor so it's nice and maintainable and easy, but don't do extra stuff just because you might need it someday. It's sort of the, what's her name, uh, condo approach to tidying, right? Just keep the code that brings you joy. <laughs> so the argument here is, you ain't going to need it. If you read this all in, your luck is going to be you're not going to need this page and this page and this page. You're just going to need one page. So, wait. You get a memory access in here. What do you do? So someone says, give me this byte. Well, what's going to you want to read then? How do you know this memory access is happening? Yeah, you're going to set up so it's page fault. So therefore, you're going to start with all these being, yeah, not, not present. Okay, boom. You try and read from here, you get a page fault. And then in response to that, you say, I'm going to read the whole thing in now? No, you say, I'm going to just read what I need to read because I'm not going to need the rest of it. So you read in world, right? In the eternity it takes to read it in from disk, you go and do a lot of other things. You get an interrupt, comes back that says the disk read is completed, and you then return from that page fault. All right. Clearly, this is not JOS we're talking about, because JOS uh, you know, requires that a system call finish. So now the user can freely read in here. What happens if they write? Do we want to write back immediately to the file? I say no because they may be 
changing world to, I don't know, all uppercase, one character at a time, for example. And we'd hate to have one, two, three, four, five writes to disk. So therefore, the user comes along, they change that to W, I don't know, they change this to R, they change this to D. What's happened to our page table entry here? It's dirty. Should we write this out someday at least? Yeah. Yes, clearly we should write it out someday. When? Any ideas? When they unmap it seems that's a possibility of when we could do it. What's the latest we could do it? Yeah, when they close the file. I mean, theoretically, we could kind of wait even later, but close. We could postpone it until they do a close because they gave us an open file descriptor, right? And so we could wait until the close to write this out. Or what if we have a lot of memory pressure, right? Then we're running out of, we're running out of main memory. Then we look through here. We say any that are dirty, we need to write out. This needs to be integrated with our buffer cache. So if someone else does reading and writing through regular techniques or themselves do a mem map, mem map, we need to make sure that we are synchronized so that we have a single view of this. And this, we would want this to be basically the, the cache of that block for that file. Mm -hmm. Let's so. say I'm a user and I want it to go back to the file immediately because I care about like being on disk, can you tell them not to do that? You might be able, so there is a flush call for file descriptors. And um, so that would be the way you would probably do that. And you wouldn't have access to a page by page um, writing out. Okay. Does this make sense? Any questions on this? Um, mProtect allows you, once you have a mapping, to change the permission. So you can change, you know, no, none, read, readable, writable, executable, where I don't believe, I don't, I, I would have to look to see whether writable um, implies readable, or executable implies readable. Okay. And not all systems support the exec, for example. All right, you can unmap, of course. Um, configuring a system handler. So this is how we can do the trap. We're basically saying the, it's actually not Atian. I believe it's SIG action. Um, the compiler will tell you when you try and compile this. <laughs> the weird part is I, well, I don't know why that happened. Anyway, so handle SIG seg V is your trap call that's going to be called. Um, we, Basically say, on a segmentation violation, this is what we want to have happen. <coughs> and then there are a bunch more calls that are in Linux and also various flavors of Unix. Um, I don't know if you've ever looked at a Unix history tree, genealogy basically, of all the large varieties, but there are quite a few. And there were two main branches, the Berkeley Unix and AT&T Unix, and they had different calls for memory management, you know, for, for dealing with this. But in any case, you can advise, for instance. So advise says, in this range of memory, I'm going to be, ex I'm going to be referencing it in order. Okay? And that's really handy. That means, for instance, if you're reading this into disk, maybe you want to read the next couple into disk too, knowing that they're accessing in order. Or you're accessing randomly, for example. Yeah. Good question. Oh, yeah. So why are we calling this a segmentation error? 
error in Linux, but we're calling it a page fault in DOS and IPv6? It's just historical okay. that it was segment in. Uh, and it's totally unrelated. It's unrelated to the segmentation of the of the OS. Yeah. And now that I look on the syncing, you asked about the syncing. So there's an msync. I just didn't realize it. So. OK. Um, protecting and unprotecting is just done with improtect. Trap is done with sig action. Map, sorry, dirty doesn't have a Unix way of doing that. But there is a workaround. So what would the workaround be? So what I want to know, here's what I want to know. From time x to time y, has there any write happened to a particular uh, page of memory? Like that's what dirty tells you. Map it as read only, and then if you get a signal, you Mark that the writes happen and mark as read write. Okay, so the workaround is set the page to read only. Then to wait. <laughs> Three on page fault. Mark as read writable. And save somewhere that it's dirty. Yeah, so you're paying basically one page fault for each dirty page. Okay, now, that's more than you'd pay if your hardware supports dirty, right? Well, sorry, that's more than you'd pay if your hardware and operating system support dirty. So if you're running, um, Oh, let's say Linux, because I don't think they provide access to the dirty. If you're running Linux on x86 hardware, the dirty is supported by the hardware, but not by the OS. Okay. Let us look at the homework. All right, so let's look at the test code to see what this is doing. All right, so the test code goes through and a many times and then randomly picks a element of the square roots array and the next time picks the one right after it and first and calculates square roots, calculated what the square root should be and then checks in the square roots array. So basically it's just making sure, ensure that the square roots array is correct. And here's the square roots array, right? Where we have one entry, and we have a square root for each one, right? The key is and let me get rid of this comment out that I did. So let me just right, what should happen is we say we're validating. And it goes through and chugs away and says, yes, it's good. OK? So if at any point the squares don't match, it likes it. And if you have some sort of a triple page fault or something, it'll also exit, right? So if you have some error. So we could just make this big square roots array and go on our way. The problem is. Where's the number of square roots? It's right at the top in the, the files. 
Thousand. Oh, max squares. Yeah, there's so one less twenty-seven. So that's twenty is a million. Seven is one twenty-eight. So one hundred twenty-eight million square root tables and trees. So that can be large, right? And if it's not large enough, we just make it more, and then we'll agree that it's large. Okay. So we have our square roots array, and our theory on this is we're not using all of it all the time. So we're going to go ahead and have a, an imaginary square roots array that just calculates mostly on demand, right? In the same way that we were reading our file in on demand, we'll go ahead and have a page of square root table entries and fill that out on demand. And once it's in memory, we can then use it for other stuff. And if we were really smart with this square roots array, we would go ahead and keep maybe an LRU of the recently used pages and keep those in memory and flush out ones we don't need. We have a very small cache of one, right? So we're going to keep one page in memory. And the nice thing about that is it's not hard to figure out what to evict, right? It's the one that's there. So let us start with setting up the square roots region. So you didn't write this, right? Square roots, it calls map, mmap, and maps max square roots times size of double plus our AS limit. So So we're saying the maximum limit that we can have is going to be less than the size of our array. And I'm just trying to think why we have to have the adding the AS limit here. And I don't have a good, good reason. It seems like all we really need is max square roots times size of double. So what we're basically saying to the operating system is, give me, I don't care where it is, but just give me an address that's large enough to hold all this. And then we're going to turn around and get rid of it. Okay. So that will tell us where the square roots should be. And then we release it. And we set a limit because we want to actually fail if we try and uh, allocate too much memory to verify that we didn't that we didn't handle this just by successively filling this in and leaving it all in memory because that's not as interesting. So our handle sig. This is the sig action with a C. And that's our code here. So we get given the faulting address. And then based on the faulting address, we can figure out which page within square roots this belongs. Back up a second. Before we have our first page fault, what memory have we mapped? None. We mapped, and it gave us back square roots, but then we unmapped it. Okay? So we know there's a hole in our address space big enough for square roots, but it's not mapped. So if, since it's not mapped, what's going to happen if we try to access it? Page fault. Okay? So we're getting a page fault. But not because we mapped it with no protection. It's not mapped at all. It's just a hole that we know is big enough to hold the square roots. Drew. So, so you create using mmap the space, but then when you unmap it, unmap it, how is it guaranteed that that space will still exist like when you have a page fault in your comment? Are you still going to be mapping a certain page to that space? So what happens is we know we've got in our larger address space, Here's our bigger address space. 
And we know we've got a hole here big enough for our square root table. We have to assume that the operating system isn't going to just go allocate stuff in this address space for us, um, which seems reasonable that it wouldn't, it wouldn't just be doing that. Okay, but if we did, we'd have a problem. If all of a sudden it made a page in here, then that'd be a problem. So we unmap the old page because we've got only this one buffer that we're trying to deal with. So that's why we, why we get rid of this. I commented this out. And uh, I don't remember if I was patient enough to wait till it finally failed. But it got really, really slow because right? memory was, was basically filling up. So we're unmapping the old square roots. And then what we do is we map in the page that we're interested in based on which square root is trying to be read for the page size. We want it readable and writable. We want it to be writable because we're about to write it. You can imagine that after we write it, we could then turn around and make it read only. Right. So after we calculated the square roots into there, we could go ahead and make it read only. So we have a nice read only array if we want. And fixed because no, I don't want you to make it any other spot but exactly this. Right. Does that make sense? Any questions? Mandika. I don't know. Let's look. Man, uh, what was it? M on map? So let's look here. Oh, and by the way, this is interesting to look at that the type of memory. System 5 shared. So this is this AT&T had a system called System 5. So their way or their API for doing this. So let's again return values. Uh, success. Oh, will fail if. So, not page aligned. We were okay there. The length parameter is negative zero. You're okay there. Some part of the region being mapped is not part of the currently valid address space. That would seem to hit your air. Right? Yeah, I don't know. To make this more fun, I took your already written unmap everything call and just unmapped the whole thing. Oh. Uh, So I guess it was happy. I thought it was happy because there was always something in there you could find on the map. It turns out it turns out it wasn't even. Yeah. yeah. So that's interesting. So I don't know. You can imagine it's sort of reasonable as a special case. I mean, well, yeah. I, I see the argument of why it might do it that way, but it does seem to contradict the. Yeah, there are two ways to interpret that. Right. So, like, if this was like it was greater than 2 to the 32 or something like yeah. that. Um, or above UTOP in a kind of JOS example. It's distinct from, like, I mean, yeah. part of the valid address space is just not mapped, but you're certainly in the address Yeah. So, so yeah. that may be what we're looking at is valid may just be, it could be mapped, not that it is mapped. If you have the equivalent of JOS, where we've got some stuff that's for the kernel, that's not part of the valid address space. Right? You don't get to unmap the stuff that the kernel's mapped for you, and that should clearly result in an error. OK? But it doesn't, does it? It doesn't. What doesn't? The, as this system? Uh, we would have to look and see for Linux. I'm running this on Darwin, right, on a, on a Mac OS. So that's a different, a different story. But basically, what part, if any, of the address space is reserved for the kernel? And actually, there's got to be some part of the address space reserved for the kernel, almost assuredly. At least one page. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be a specific part reserved, as long as it has enough space that's reserved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is an error if you do this. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> 
OK, so let's see, back to OneNote. OK, concurrent garbage collection. Concurrent with what? The distinction is a concurrent garbage collection versus a stop and, stop and pause garbage collection. OK, the stop and pause ones, you know, and old lisps and things like that were very unpleasant, where you don't know when. But at any point when you were trying to allocate memory, you might say, oh, you know what? Now is a good time to do some garbage collection. You just wait a second. I'm going to go clean the house, all this stuff. When I'm done, I will, I, I will, I will go for you. Right? So that's large, unpredictable latency. And so one likes it uh, if you have some more predictability. So you have concurrent garbage collection. So Baker's algorithm is a, is, a, is a copying garbage collector. There are other types of garbage collector, but this will actually copy data from one spot to another spot. So we have a from space and a to space. So we actually only get to use half of the memory. Okay, so that's kind of a, a downside of this. But we're going to have the from space and the to space. We have a picture in just a moment. At the start, everything's in the from space. At the end, everything's in the to space that's reachable, that you can get to. The stuff that's no longer accessible is, is not copied and therefore is garbage. So here's what happens. We start off in the from space. We've got these objects. Notice we have four of them that are live. How do we know they're live? Because we've got some pointers to them. We start in garbage collection normally with a set of starting points. The starting points are like the registers or what's on the stack or globals. My claim is if you can't get it from a register, can't get to it from a register, can't get to it from the stack or can't get to it from a global, you can't get to it. Does that make sense? Okay. So what happens is, and we have garbage here. These three don't have anything pointing to them. So the root is going to, we're going to start off by taking the root, which will actually be a collection of things, can registers, stack, global variables. We'll say we just have one something. And we're going to put it in, into the two space and say it's not yet been scanned. That's what the little dots around it. Okay. And the garbage collection then takes, basically says, anything that's not scanned, scan it. That is, find in the object all the references to other objects. And if they're in the from space, copy them to the to space and update your pointer. So in this case, we scan the root by looking at all its references, of which it has one, copying that reference to the to space and updating our pointer. Okay, It's now been scanned. Now we do the same thing for this one. So, and we're going to do it, I think, one object at a time. So we'll go ahead and first copy over the one object, which will now be unscanned. We're still unscanned because we haven't dealt with all of our references. So we're talking about this one here, right? This one is still unscanned because we still got this to deal with. Right? So now we copy that one over, and now this guy's been scanned. We quickly scan this guy and say there's no pointers in it, done. And then finally we do this last unscanned, copy it over. We better scan that one. It's scanned, great, we're done. What does that tell us? In the bottom, there are no more, scan no more unscanned objects. Everything has been scanned, which means that we've gotten to everything we can get to and it's all been copied out of the from space. So what about these objects here? That's garbage. 
we just clear off everything up in the from space. And then next time we do garbage collection, we'll flip them around. Okay. So I understand how this works in a stop and garbage collect mode. We just go do this and then we continue on. But if we're trying to do this concurrently, we've got some issues. Let's say we're like this. So our rule is sort of going to be we're going to have two threads running at time. One thread is going to be going through doing this scanning and copying. Okay. The other thread is your main program that you want to be running. And it's going to just go be running. And the rule we want to have is when it's running, if it runs across something that hasn't been scanned, it should go in ahead and scan it and copy it over. So it should do a little garbage collection as well. What that means is it's going to have to be checking each of its pointer, each of its pointer accesses or references to see is this pointing to something in our from space or in our to space. So every time we dereference a, a pointer, we have to say, does it point to something in the from space? And if so, we've got to copy it over. Okay. So every dereference in our main program has to have some extra code in it. So the idea then is use the hardware to help us, use the virtual memory hardware. Um, and yeah, we do have a potential race condition if our garbage collector is going through and trying to deal with a particular object and so, so is this. So it's a, it's a little bit of a, a problem. It's certainly doable. Baker's algorithm has been implemented many, many times. It's just we have this slowness. So, but here's the idea of how VM primitives can help. We separate, this really doesn't differentiate well uh, on this slide. So we're going to break apart our two space into two different types of pages. Scanned pages and unscanned pages. And we're going to make the unscanned pages be um, read and write protected. Right? So we can't read and write them. And we're going to make the scanned ones read and write. Right? Because anything in here doesn't point to, there's no references to the from space, right? <coughs> because that's what happens once it gets scanned. We know we've copied everything over into the two space. But here is dangerous. We don't know what's the deal with references in here. Some of them may be referring back into the from space. So we want to stop the main program. So the main program is going to get a page fault. For instance, when we try to, okay, so think of this object as having some fields in it, right, that are object references, that are pointers, and it tries to go read one of those pointers. So we read in here our main program, uh, reads a pointer field from this guy. Okay. So it's going to actually be, let's say, that field that points up to that. Right? Well, it could be that field. If it does get that field, we know we don't like this pointer. Because this pointer is an old pointer that points into the from space. We'd like to update this with a new pointer. And the nice part is we've got a page fault, so we can go fix, we can go fix stuff. Right? So it's reading a field from there. This is in a page, because right? these are multiple pages. So we've got a page here, we've got a page here, and so on. And we might have other objects in here too, right? in the same page. So on the page, the page fault 
is when you try and access an object in the unscanned region. If the fault happens for each object on the page, so for each one of these four objects, we go through and visit the references. That is, go through all of the pointers in each of them, and if they're pointing into the old stuff, copy them and point them. Okay. And then, once we've done that, so in this case, handling the page fault, we would get rid of this, we would copy this over to, I don't know, let's put it over into here, and we would update this pointer to here. And then we would mark this whole thing scanned. That is, it would be green now. All right? So from the point of view of the main program, let's get to this page, where to go. From the point of view of the main program, it tried to access an object, and that object, that access worked. And it got back a pointer. It got back either a non-pointer, like an integer, and it got its integer, or it got back a pointer that points into our to space. So it's never going to see anything pointing into the from space once we've started the garbage collection. And we can have this background thread that's going through and just running through and scanning pages, right? Scanning objects in page and I'm protecting them. It's Drew. Like Here's the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, let me do a page that hasn't had as much writing on it. So here we are. And we have our main program. And it goes and goes to this object and grabs this pointer. Okay. We don't want, once we've started garbage collection, to deal with anything in here. We want to only be dealing with objects in the, in the two space. So we would have to, in our main program, whenever we get this reference to another object, check and see, is this pointing over into the other space? And if so, we need to fix that, which means we need to move this over here. So what we're avoiding is that test. Because instead what happens is when we try and go grab this pointer from this object, we get a page fault. And the page fault will quickly go move this guy over here and any other references in this page. And now when it reads, it won't read this pointer. It will read the pointer to the copy that we've made into the uh, two space. So We are doing the copy at the same time we would do it otherwise. The difference is we don't have to have special code in here that is testing for this and then calling and making and doing a copy. Instead, we're saying we're going to let the hardware tell us when this happens and we're going to do the copy. Now, given we can only do this on gross boundaries, which are these page boundaries, we've got to deal with all the objects in that page while we're there. Um, so, in the case of tagged data, it's easy. So if we look at Lisp or Python or Smalltalk or things like that, you don't just have raw data. You have typed data that you know what it is. So you can see that this is a pointer. Yeah. There have been garbage collectors that have been added to C that are conservative and they basically look at um, things that could be pointers. So anything that looks like it could be a pointer, we'll, we'll say is a pointer, and we'll go ahead and not mark that stuff as, as, as garbage. Anything that could be pointed to. 
but it's, it's hard in C. So I'm assuming we have some sort of a, uh, a typed, um, not a typed language, but a, um, a dynamic language that maintains this information at runtime. The very colored page? Yeah. Where'd it go? Whoops. Uh, it You're right, it's down. This um, one. Yeah. Yes. So presumably, like with the other one, once you copied everything from the from this to the two space, then the two space becomes. Becomes a from space. Yes, you swap. So then, what if you had some global variable that you never used and never accessed and was just on its own page somewhere and it was pointing to some object? So let me back up a second. We still, so we're not done until this is all green. Okay, so there are two possibilities of how something turns green. One, the running program accesses it. Or two, the background garbage collector is going through on its own, right? So we have two separate threads. One is the main program that's kind of running around all over this as it's, as it's accessing objects. And the other one is the methodical garbage collector that says, okay, I'm going to start at this page, scan it, green it. This page, scan it, green it. This page, scan it, green it. I was going to do this page, but I don't need to. It's already been greened. This page, scan it, green it. When we're done and they're all green, then we're done. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So what do we need in order to do this? Uh, we need to protect a range of pages. So protect M is a, is a good way to do that. We need a trap handler, we need to unprotect, and we also need to deal with the garbage collection, which needs to read the data in a page, and the main program, which we don't want to read that data. We want it to get a page fault. So the easiest way to do that is have the same page mapped two different places. Right? One with no read, no write, and one used by the garbage collector that will be mapped read writable. Okay? The main program's never going to see this one. The main program is going to be just working up here, but the garbage collector will use this one and can then go read, find all the objects, find all the pointers, copy them over, and when it's done, unmap it here and mark it as, as read writable up here. Questions? Um, I'm going to come back to generational garbage collection on Monday. However, what I want to just point out is then kind of a, a summary. So there's nothing you can do with virtual memory in a user level program that you can't do without it. Trivially, with virtual memory, you have a Turing machine. Without virtual memory, you have a Turing machine. And so we could do the same thing, right? Um, and really, in some cases, you can save quite a lot. You can make stuff a lot easier by using these virtual memory primitives. Okay? But it can always be done without it. Just like you can always write any program you want in C, using malloc and free and, and, and low-level uh, uh, low level coding. So some, worth, some ways in which it's worth it. Avoids complex compiler changes. Um, in the case we were just looking at, right, accessing fields requires, would have required some extra code. By using the virtual memory, we don't have to change it. It can still work unchanged. And that could be important, right? You might have a large Lisp interpreter, and it, you, when it was written, it just assumed there was going to be a stop the world garbage collection, where when you went to allocate, if there wasn't enough space or it was short on space, it would go do the garbage collection. It's just never expected this. So that might be a large change to this. And 
it could be a lot faster. Right? So just because you can write something in two different Turing machines, one might be a lot faster than the other. So we have this specialized and optimized logic. Right? We have basically these page tables that are there exactly to check every reference very quickly. Okay? One con, and this is part of really why this paper was written, the paper was written to do two things. To say, you know guys, you should really provide this because there's stuff we could do with it. And second, you should make it quick because if it's really slow, like, it's not worth using it. We, we waste all of the gains we got from having the hardware help. And there are certainly cases where the hardware may not map well to your domain. Right? If your page tables, for instance, are extremely large, uh, um, that just may not map well to what you want. Um, it's hard, because of this abstraction, for most kernels to provide really high performance uh, access to this paging hardware. Uh, and we are going to look next week at the idea of exokernels. And so JOS is approximately an exokernel. In fact, I wouldn't say that. JOS is exokernelish. Okay? The basic idea of exokernel is to say provide low level access to all the hardware that you can and let lots of stuff happen in user space. Okay? So it's not just this idea of a, of a, of a minimal operating system. It's, it's an operating system that, um, well, that does exactly that. So we still need to provide some protection between processes, but as much as possible, provide access to underlying hardware. The idea, for instance, in JOS that you can read the page tables is an example of that. Okay? Very few operating systems allow you to read the page tables. So when we come back on Monday, we are going to finish just talking about the other use case. Lab 5. When is Lab 5 due? Next week. Next week. That's right. So good for you. Um, and for next Monday, you do need to write up the answer to a question and submit a question, okay, under Gradescope for next Monday. So look on the schedule, look at what the, hard, the homework is, but basically from now on that's what we're going to be doing.